thank you all for being able to come out tonight, and I'm particularly happy that, um, that Constance did agree to, to be part of our uh, speaker series this year. Um, she's an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa in the Department of Communications, and uh, very active in the digital humanities uh, degree at the University of Ottawa and projects, and so uh, she and I have had the good fortune of being able to work together and teach together sometimes. So um, as you will hear and learn today more, she's uh, co-director of this project, Lesbian and Gay Liberation, uh, Liberation in Canada project, um, with Michelle Swartz at Ryerson University. Um, and she serves as the Vice President of the Canadian Society for Digital History, Société Canadienne des Humanités Numériques, and as an Associate Director of the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. And she splits her time between the archives and internet, but she's also not let us know about this, but this is something that I recommend to you. And she's co-edited um, Doing Digital Humanities, Practice, Training, and Research, which she co-edited with uh, Richard J. Lane and Ray Simons. And so if you're sort of trying to find that place and point of departure, it's a great uh, uh, addition to your collection. So welcome and look forward to hear from you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is a very warm welcome. I, I must say, I was actually like, feeling like, more nervous about this talk than usual. And then I, I started out in English Lit, but then got like slurped into sort of the digital world and feel like, like uh, so often I go to talk about this project and the project's like just on the technological front and then like all week I was talking to Michelle uh, who co-directs this project with me um, about like I'm going to like talk to like real historians. <laughs> 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 I hope it sort of goes well but it's also a pleasure really to get to talk about like I don't know sort of like historical like influence and methodological kind of influence in a way that um, uh, Michelle is in um, library science like in the way that like at um, library and digital humanities conferences we don't always get to do. So anyway, we'll dive, uh, dive right in. Um, so I was sort of like introducing a project, but then I do want to talk a little bit, if I may, about this in historiography um, that underpins the project in the way that we're kind of growing it out. Um, the uh, uh, Lesbian Gay Liberation in Canada project um, is one that I, that I work on with Michelle Schwartz from Ryerson University and our colleague Donald McLeod, who's from the U of T Libraries, where for years he worked as uh, the head of acquisitions. Um, but he also volunteers at what was the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives and is now like the archives with a Q, that one, yeah. Um, and that in his like spare time, um, uh, really gave, has given years, years of his time to um, volunteering, making sure that like the reading room is open, helping to like orient new researchers, and to really keep this communi community archive um, afloat. And he noticed in the 1990s that more and more researchers were coming in who didn't know about the things that had happened in the 60s and 70s, sort of like only a scan sort of 20 years before. And so he started um, a book project of his own uh, which led to the first um, volume of Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada, uh, which is a, um, a chronology of events, of poetry readings, protests, um, uh, 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 demonstrations, um, movie screenings, uh, sort of the whole nine yards, which he like painstakingly amassed by reading through periodicals. And like um, Don is like not particularly into digital things. He has. Um, uh, index cards, and he keeps the index cards in order, and he like doesn't work with research assistants, and he doesn't write grant applications, he's like, I'm gonna spend my time, I'm not gonna chase those things, I'm gonna spend my time, um, you know, just in the archives, like doing uh, that, that archival research. Uh, and uh, he had maintained his copyright uh, rights to the first volume, uh, and uh, Michelle and I met him when we were working uh, at the archives as volunteers, too, and just like, oh, Don, this book is amazing, we'll like look at it in a moment. It would be great if we could take all the information in here and like slice and dice it in some way. Like, what you know? How could we look at like all the events that come from one city, or like see how like one activist like travels around the country? Like, could we work with that text? And Don said to us like, well, I mean, it's already digital. It's in PDF. Uh, you're welcome to it if you if you like. And we thought like oh, we could do like more digital stuff. Anyway, so that that's sort of the genesis um, of this project, which we've been working on uh, three of us together with. Now, like 14 research assistants who have been like amazing, like we would be nowhere without them um, in the last like um, six years. And 
Uh, we now have a public history website uh, that's up at lglc.ca, which I'll, I'll do that like thing that they say you should never do in a talk, where you like do a live demo. <laughs> which is like, dear lady, I hope that worked work too. Um, but uh, but the, this was sort of this genesis of this, um, uh, of this particular project. And one of the things that now Michelle and I are working on, we've you know, encoded the text and, and the material that, that um, John has put together, we now have in database form, and it's navigable, and we have a front end on it. And now we're starting to talk about like what are the best ways to um, augment and continue to expand the material that's in here. Uh, John isn't interested in releasing anything beyond 1981. The number of events in Canada sort of explode from there on in, and he's working on um, uh, a chronology of the AIDS crisis in Toronto from 1981 onwards. But that this two book series spans 1964, the founding of the first homosexual society at UT, up to the start of the AIDS crisis, and then it's like too, there's too much to cover to him from 1981 across the entire country. What Michelle and I like to do is sort of to go back and to add material, especially that material that isn't um, always so easily archivable. The content that we have here tends to skew particularly towards uh, men's events because of that like archival archivability of a lot of the um, periodicals, like many of the sort of more substantive periodicals were by men and for men and, and address their interests. Um, things like uh, flyers for boys clubs and, and that kind of thing are more easily archived, archivable than uh, like flyers for a consciousness raising potluck in the Kootenays and that kind of thing. And so we're looking to sort of increase um, our representation of women in the project um, in order to, um, to also be able to trace sort of like queer women's intellectual history um, in this time period. So the moment we've taken the books and we now have 34,000 records spanning this 17 year time stretch of people, places, and things. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about like where we're going next and kind of what we're adding in there. But also some of our like inspiration for how to think about women's materials and how to get more women's materials um, uh, in here. Uh, our thinking of this like started with uh, like a trip to Aid Books. I used to live in Victoria, which is like where Aid Books is. Like it is also a physical place in addition to being like an online um, sales. Like I think it's now since been bought out by some book you belongs to Kenzo now or something like this. Um, but I got a, a copy of uh, a book from the late seventies called Lesbian Lists, which was this like DIY um, publication by Del Martin, where she had just uh, put. Oh, I wish. I lost it in the movie. I wish I had it here. Uh, but um, uh, it's full of lists of like um, nuns you never heard of but were probably up to things that they shouldn't have been. Or, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, women, women writers whose books uh, have good content, like that, that sort of thing. And she sort of had these lists. And it was that like self publishing and like DIY, like sort of mining of like history and kind of rumor um, that Michelle and I um, have found um, sort of uh, inspirational. Uh, so we uh, um, I have like formal, formal things to read formally um, here because I'm too chatty by nature and I will go over time. Um, that definitely Michelle and I have since like tried to look out for more and more of these kinds of works and have been really influenced by the taxonomic kind of listing work um, of, um, uh, of lesbians in the 20th century and of the sort of like self-publishing and circulation and bookmobile um, kind of work that these women were doing. And there's a real, um, there's a real sort of uh, like connection and community sort of feedback uh, loop uh, of this kind of work of, of women surfacing. Um, uh, things from history that speak to their own um, experience. Uh, and, and we are very much inspired by uh, Lillian Faderman, who talks about the possibility of life as a lesbian, which had to be socially constructed in order for women to be able to choose such a life. Uh, Adrian Rich also wrote in um, her essay, It Is the Lesbian and Us, that we rely on literature and history and books and libraries and schools to uh, tell us like, what is possible um, and that, as she said, whatever is unnamed and undepicted in images, whatever is omitted from biography or censored in collections of letters, whatever is misnamed as something else, uh, made difficult to come by, whatever is buried in the memory um, by the collapse of meaning under an inadequate or lying language, 
this is what becomes not merely unspoken, but unspeakable. One of the sort of things that are hidden in here. Uh, she quotes um, Emily Dickens with the My Classics Veil Their Faces, uh, sort of saying that um, so many, especially in formal education, like so many young women are pre presented with, um, uh, with classic, classics that veil um, not only what might be possible, but some of the things that might have been going on kind of all along. Uh, and throughout the 20th century, um, certainly lesbian feminists like, painstakingly worked through this history to reconstruct and self-publish lesbian history, um, uh, a history that they could respond to and sort of a history of which they were part. Um, we take great inspiration from uh, Jeanette Howard Foster, who was um, a member of the student council at Rockford, Illinois in 1917, and was like called upon to help arbitrate in what was called a morals case. And she said, like, as a young woman at the time, she wasn't even really sure what a morals case uh, referred to, but it was young women who had been caught up to no good. Um, uh, and that, that even the language of morals case, she wasn't sure what it referred to, but this is an example of that uh, inadequate or lying language that Rich uh, points to. Uh, she began the process of researching same-sex attraction among women, uh, work which quickly transcended uh, her original sort of self-education purpose and became a bibliography of references to romantic women, uh, romantic relationships between women in literature and poetry, uh, a bibliography that she worked on with her partner uh, Hazel Tulliver um, for, um, for almost 40 years. Uh, at the time she was re uh, that she published it, she was employed as a professor and as a researcher with Alfred Kinsey um, as well as a librarian at the University of uh, Kansas. So her like initial work of the like, what could this moral case be about, and like, what is in out there in literature, um, was eventually published in, uh, self-published in 54, um, as uh, the Sex Variant, Sex Variant Women in Literature, subtitled A Historical and Quantitative Survey, which begins with Sappho and kind of ends like 200 and 2,600 years later um, with Patricia Highsmith's novel, The Price of Salt. Um, then having like self-published this bibliography, oh, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, she uh, sent a copy to the latter, which was the print um, uh, arm of the lesbian organization Daughters of uh, Belitis. And in 1957, uh, Marion Zimmer Brownlee um, reviewed the book in the magazine, proclaiming it you know, totally invaluable, um, inspired Bradley and another writer for the latter, uh, Barbara Greer, began work on the checklist, the checklist, um, which was a hand-typed mimeographed bibliography of lesbian content in literature. Um, it was first published in 1960 and revised and kind of updated from there on in. Um, in the introduction to the, the checklist, Bradley and Greer urged their readers to invest in Foster's book as the definitive and like major work um, on the subject, uh, but they say that um, since Foster's book was published, like many new novels on lesbianism have been published, uh, and the diligent search um, of many collectors has brought old works to light. Uh, they also promise, and I quote again here, um, to review in some detail the novels which were omitted from Dr. Forrest Foster's work to strive for completeness, and, I quote again, that their work includes many works um, whose lesbian content is too slight, too subtle, or too trashy to have come within the scope of the scholarly studies of Dr. Foster. And so the, there's a lot of trash. Um, so the entries uh, in their bibliography um, are coded like A or B for um, major or minor lesbian character action, and C <coughs> for latent repressed lesbianism or characters who might be so interpreted, uh, and then works that are inside um, a T. The T indicates that, uh, I'm quoting it here, regardless of the quality of lesbian action or characters in the book, the quality of the overall book is essentially poor. The T is for trash. <laughs> so they sort of expanded beyond <laughs> the of, um, of literature. So this sort of like authentication by accumulation was sort of a self-naming process, a grassroots creation of collective meaning and identity that continued throughout the 20th century. Um, in uh, 1976, the brand new Lesbian Her Story Archives in Brooklyn, New York, um, set out a second, in the second issue of their uh, newsletter, a uh, bibliography of bibliographies. Uh, it only had four <coughs> bibliographies on it, but at least there were like, it wasn't just like, here are some books, like, here are some other lists of books. Uh, uh, 
including Foster, Greer, and uh, as well as Mary Coombs' Women Loving Women, an annotated bibliography, which had been published by the self-created press, women's press in 1975, um, uh, and a four-page section of one issue of Amazon Quarterly. It's the place to go to find out more. Um, the newsletter implored its readers that, I'm quoting again here, it is clear that careful searching is still required to find references to lesbians in all works, including those fe published by feminists. Uh, bibliographies on lesbian culture desperately need to be done. So they, they say, here are some, but we need more of this kind of work. Now, 1967 was also the year that Lillian Faderman began her work on her groundbreaking um, uh, book about lesbian history, Surpassing the Love of Men, uh, which was eventually published in uh, 1981. She had discovered Foster's book in 1961 while she was um, a graduate student at UCLA. Um, and she had, uh, had found it in the stacks of the English reading room and then would return to the reading room like again and again like while hiding the book and its binding just to read um, through Foster's um, bibliography. And she described uh, Foster as her model for surpassing the love of men about how one could do serious scholarship about lesbian subject matter. So this like desire to like list and keep listing and accumulate regardless of whether lesbianism is like minor or just interpreted or um, and this desire to like kind of include everything, whether that means like items that are classified as like tea for trash is still common in queer communities. Um, auto straddle. Um, uh, a website that's aimed at lesbian, bisexual, and queer women, both cis and trans, um, has taken up this kind of DIY lesbian historiography, um, pub publishing all manners of lists online. Um, in their post, the top 10 most sexually prolific lesbians uh, and bisexuals of old Hollywood, Autostraddle takes up a chart format sort of made famous by uh, Showtime's The L Word, uh, L Word, which had a chart of who slept with whom and who slept with together. This is their uh, auto straddles, uh, the chart, old Hollywood edition, um, in which the author of the post uh, collates a series of historical facts and rumors and innuendo to map out same-sex relationships um, of famous female uh, entertainers, uh, some of them like Marlene Dietrich, who lived sort of openly gay and bisexual lives, and others like Barbara Stanwyck or Catherine Hepburn, um, who were, uh, as they sort of say here, like potentially deeply closeted. Um, the author gleefully admits that a lot of this information could be false, but it could also possibly be true, uh, <laughs> which fully embodies uh, the lesbian historiographer's belief in the importance of inclusion above all else, um, working as John Nessel, one of the founders of the Lesbian History Archive, says uh, to change this um, deprivation and lack of access to information into sort of cultural plentitude. Which is like a very long way of making, not excuses for ourselves, but like, who is sort of saying like, so we want to know what it is people wrote on the back of napkins and then put inside some old book that like used to belong to a grandmother somewhere because we're not going to find all the stuff that we need to build out the project just in sort of official archives. Um, <laughs> that's it. We will find a lot in archives. In a moment, I want to talk a little bit about um, the pleasure of being in Ottawa and particularly at Ottawa U, where the women's movement archives um, are. Um, maybe I should do that before I, I'm just totally just going to stay right after that and then come back to the technological stuff. Um, one of the things that, it, oh, too far. Ah, uh, one of the things that has been a real um, pleasure for me is that, well, it's a double pleasure. I grew up in Ottawa and then moved away for 20 years and never thought I would come back. Um, but uh, one of the things that really did draw me to, to Ottawa U is that the women's movement archives are here and that they have made a really concerted effort not just to keep like the official pa you know, um, papers of NAC and, and, and groups like that, but also to collect ephemera that might have some of these sort of like traces um, in it. So if you, if you haven't been to that archive, um, I highly recommend it. We are really using it to, um, to augment and sort of fill in some of the gaps um, in our project. Uh, that's it. I did promise a digital history talk, so <laughs> what's the infrastructure like? How did you make it? Uh, we're going to sort of say all of those things, too. Um, so the project at, it, at its heart uh, didn't start with just like small scraps of paper, but did start with 
Don's like a careful, painstaking reading through of um, periodicals, mostly at the Canadian Legend of the Archives, also <coughs> traveled broadly and, and researched here as well. Um, which he then typeset himself. This is what um, Lesbian Media Liberation in Canada looks like as a, as a book. It's probably hard to see the back, but there are um, uh, events, and each event has uh, a date and a location, if there's a location associated, and then like a short blurb that describes what happens at this event, uh, followed by a bibliographic uh, entry or entries, um, so you can sort of see where John got his information. And it's become a very useful work for, as a springboard for other people's research. If you want to know where to read, the bibliography listings are, are very sort of useful here. So Michelle and I, like, in looking at this, could say, like, oh, I can see that we've got events, we've got bibliographic entries, we've got periodicals. It'd be nice to see like which periodicals are writing about what and when. Um, uh, we've got dates and we've got places. If we want to be able to trace the history of ideas and events and how people move across the country, it'd be great to kind of pull some of those things out. Uh, so we uh, decided to mark the text up in GIXML, which is a, uh, a markup language that was originally designed for use in like history and English um, to mark up existing texts and to produce scholarly editions of like Jane Austen novels and, and that sort of thing. And, and as a markup language, it has really expanded to include ways of representing uh, people, places, and things. And that was that's what we have. We have people, places, and things, and events. Uh, so underlined here are the things we're trying to capture. I don't have to learn that enough with this talk, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> Here's like one of these events um, that is wrapped up in event tags. Each person's name um, uh, gets a tag around it that points back to a unique identifier for that person. So we certainly have lots of people whose names change over um, the, the course of the project. We have people, or over the course of the years covered by the project. Um, and uh, people who uh, you know, are writing pseudonymously, but later uh, um, it's safe to sort of for them to say who they are, and so they're, um, there's sort of more and more information over time. And so even when he was starting out, John said like, he wasn't sure how many people are in his books um, or uh, hadn't been able to like, reconcile like, a lot of the pseudonyms and stuff. So that's some of the work um, that we have uh, done. The nice thing about XML is that it's, um, an archivable format. Uh, it's like platform agnostic. Uh, in, in writing XML, it's you know it's free. Like no one's going to show up and say like, no, you're using this proprietary language of ours, and we would like a fee for that. Or you don't have to worry about like Adobe no longer supporting things. Or like, but, like it's you can write XML like on a napkin, and it will still be like perfectly valid <laughs> on XML. And what's been nice for us too is that uh, the libraries are happy to take it in a way that many libraries are reluctant to take um, fully uh, digital projects, especially ones that are database driven, and that then they forever have to like migrate that database forward, and it gets updated, and it no longer runs, or, or they have to keep like a Windows 95 machine alive forever, because that's the only one that'll work on. Um, uh, XML files are flat, and they don't necessarily have any of that interactivity that makes them uh, fragile in an archival kind of sense. Um, so as we were starting out, we were lucky enough to get hooked up with the Canadian Research Writing Collaboratory at the University of Alberta, and the uh, University of Alberta has agreed to take our XML when we're done, uh, which is great. So we know that like, that will kind of last. The other nice thing about XML is, uh, in addition to being archivable, is that you can convert it out into many <coughs> different formats. So if you want to create PDFs that are you know, easy to print, you can do that. If you want to just pull out um, uh, location data and plot things on a, on a map, but um, you know, maybe not have like text or something, you can do, um, you can do that. Uh, and so I wanted to show some of the things that we've done with the, the XML um, since we're breaking it together. It's been very useful. Here we just have a little bit of like HTML we made out of it for proofreading purposes to make sure that in adding our encoding tags, we hadn't like added um, uh, any extraneous stuff that we didn't want in um, the events. Also, all of this markup has been really useful, like, analytically. Um, I'm interested in, like, I don't know, who are the people who show up in the events, but then who also show up in the bibliographic entries? Like, who are the people who are, like, at the protests and at these events, but then who also become, like, our witnesses 
to history? Like, who are the people who are writing about it, who are creating the textual record that, like, you know, as historians, people will rely on for years? Uh, it comes sort of from English lit, so I feel like I'm not allowed to say that, like, we historians, like, I'm like, not, but nervously interloping thought. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we did do that kind of conversion. I wrote an XSLT that uh, goes through and looks for every unique identifier in the events and then compares them to all the unique identifiers in the bibli uh, bibliographic records uh, and we find that there are 145 people and then that can further um, our research from saying like who are the most frequent people who are showing up and then also who are the sort of the outliers who are writing about these things but only once and also kind of showing up um, in it. Uh, uh, I also wrote an SSLT to convert this out into the format that Gephi's visualization software um, needs this is the LGLC, the first book, but with no text at all. This is just the nodes here, these sort of balls are people, and the edges, the lines that connect them, connect them together if they show up in an event together. And the more events they show up in together, the thicker the line is. And then the people who show up in the most events kind of end up in the middle with the most kind of gravity. Um, so at the very, very center, like in here somewhere, there, um, we have Ron Damon, who was the um, the editor of the Body Politic uh, Gay Liberation newspaper <coughs> uh, periodical. So it makes sense that he would sort of be in the middle. Uh, he's connected. Can't really see here, but Pierre Elliott Trudeau's in here, over here, and um, Margaret Atwood. Uh, you know, some of the people who we might sort of expect. Um, this was also useful for us, though, to like find outliers and like things we wouldn't have been able to do like just with John's book as a book. Um, so out here we have. Like we're like, well, who's who's out of this edge? This kind of corner is a series of francophone groups that, like, when we rerun this for the later years, I hope we'll end up being like a little bit more kind of connected to uh, the anglophones in the center here. Um, there are some women's groups down here, and um, general idea in our collective, which is like formed in the 1960s, but like not famous until the 80s, so they kind of end up staying in sort of those outer uh, clusters. Oh. My, I have a whiz bang visualization. This is, this is just for show. It doesn't tell you anything. That graph didn't tell you. Um, but these are all the individual people. Um, and then once we run the algorithm that gives weight to people who have a lot of connections and then pushes the people who don't have a lot of connections out towards the edge, it looks fancy when giving it time. But it just gives you one of those visualizations. It's not going to show you. Uh, that's if we did get such a charge out of doing these graph visualizations that it did shape our decisions to about what kind of database we would like for a public history site. So like we have this uh, material and we can do that kind of analysis about like who's showing up where to inform like research articles and that kind of thing. Um, but we did want a public history website that let people do some of the mixing and matching and stuff that um, that we wanted. Uh, that we had wanted to do from the start. That's why we kind of asked Ellen for it. That's, it doesn't have to be just for us. So let's try to make it a little bit more um, public friendly. Uh, so the wonder of XML is like, you code something once and output it many times. We just had that one encoding. Output is uh, HTML, output for the uh, numerical kind of analysis stuff, um, and output for the, the graph visualizations. Uh, we also then wrote XSLTs to create um, the cipher, it's the language that underpins graph databases. Um, and so underpinning our public history website is a graph database um, that is all derived from the, um, uh, the XML. It's a little blurry. It's like, you know, like on a website, like, you never tell like, how deep it is. It's like the one thing that like, is missing, like, the book? I don't know, I know where I'm at. It's this thick, and if I like read it, I can tell based on like, the weight in my left and right hand, like, how far along I am. And like, you definitely go to a website, you're like, I don't know, does it have like four pages on it? 700 pages, like, you can't really tell. Anyway, uh, that um, we said that too. Uh, this is, just in the background, the, all of the places in the chronology, these like big cluster, clustering nodes are cities. So like that's Toronto, Montreal, that's Ottawa. And then clustered around them are, um, place names, theaters, and bars, and clubs, and then those little rings right beyond them are the addresses, because we have lots of like bars that get like raided and closed down, and so they change their 
address and open up again, and the XML lets us say, oh, this bar was here from here to here at this time and from here to here at that time, so that if we ever get around to, and I would, uh, that's what I want to do, getting these things up on maps, we can do mapping based on time so people can kind of see how this movement kind of happens. So that's what the, that's 